Hey, pronouncers, we have got Josh Mejia of the Sublimation House on the episode today, how he scaled his business and to what size. We're going to dive into this and some of the um, the ups and downs of the journey as well. I always love you know, hearing it just as you don't hear as many of the downs. You, you tend to, you know, whether it's social media or magazines or uh, whatever that you read, it's always the ups. But um not easy to be able to scale a business like this. And, you know, Josh has got a lot of grit uh, to be able to do what he's done. So we're going to jump in there. But really quick, we've got four incredible sponsors that help us put this episode on every single week. Very happy to be able to share them again. First up is Supa Color. Supa Color is the world's best heat transfer. It's made for screen printers by screen printers. They understand the pressures and expectations of a screen printing business. And that's why they pride themselves on being super fast and super easy. And they're super helpful. I mean, the support's incredible. Um, the amount of times I texted Rome on stupid questions or, or their team, or they're just very quick to respond. Uh, any issues that come up, you know, I've seen overnighted packages. They're just there. They're a partner in your business. Printavo 1.5, Printavo 15, that gets you 15% off your order. And Supercolor just dropped DTF. So they have DTF available now, which is pretty cool. So their minimums are now one. Um, try them out. Uh, thanks, Supercolor. Bruce, have you heard of Multicraft underscore daddy? Um, if you need ink supplies or a daddy, Multicraft screen printing and digital supplies for over 50 years has been providing you with top brands at competitive prices. If you mention the Printable podcast, you'll receive an extra 10% off your first order. Go to his Instagram, multicraft underscore daddy. Give him a follow. He just took a picture in a throne of PMI tape. And Dave is giving away one free case of PMI tape per show. Uh, all you have to do is DM him. He'll pick one winner. Thanks so much, Multicraft. All right. Easy way. If you're spending hours cleaning screens... That is a thing of the past with EasyWay screen printing and screen cleaning chemicals. Their innovative formulas are designed to work quickly and effectively. So you can spend less time cleaning and more time creating. Plus, EasyWay's passionate and empowering team will be able to help you guys. They're uh, also a great partner. They work with hundreds of distributors around the US. They've just got a ton of resources and expert advice to be able to help your shop. Have you ever reached out to Easy Way actually on on any like <laughs> reclaim machine? I know you've got your. Uh, uh, I you know I, I talked to Alex and then if you know Alex isn't there, you know your guy Alan's there. So uh, you know uh, they're always there to help you out, and uh, we appreciate them. Um, and they got a new brand, looks really slick. Uh, new ad read. Uh, they should get a jingle. They need a jingle. I think they need. A I think you're right. All right. Uh, graphic source. Uh, if you need a solution to improve efficiency and reduce costs in your art department, go talk to graphic source. Um, they plug and play with Printavo and other shop management softwares. And it comes to SEPs, mocks, creative art, order management, embroidery, digitizing, back office, admin, customer service. There's no better company in the game. They have over 30 years, uh, of, of experience. They really know and understand shops, how to's, and uh, hit them up. Uh, Campus Inc., we have five full-time Graphxers. So uh, there is an entire uh, arsenal there. And uh, <laughs> they're incredible. So hit them up. All right. Let's jump on in. Josh? Yes. Of The Sublimation House. Great name, by the way. I appreciate it. I love the name. You're in Vegas or Vegas yes. area? Vegas. Yep. Yep. Vegas, Vegas is all Nevada. just one town. You know, there's obviously smaller suburbs on the outside, but everybody knows it as Vegas. Yeah. I'm assuming people know just based on your name what we're probably going to dig into. <laughs> um, but you know, when I first search for your company name in Google, uh -huh. I get a Google ad. So you're, you're, you're spending money on Google ads. The yeah, ads don't platform. click it, Bruce. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, click no, no, it, I'm not going to click it. I'll save the uh, 15 <laughs> the cents spend. or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, what is the strategy behind Google ads? How do, how do you use it? So we use it for inbound leads. Um, so we use it to just bring bring traffic to us. Um, we don't have an outside sales team now. 
Uh, and so we're pretty pr primarily inbound and referrals. Referrals are huge for us. We get a ton of referrals. Um, and then this is a way that like Steven and I were just talking briefly. He didn't know we existed and most people don't yet. And so using Google to leverage that when people are searching for the popular products that we offer, we pop in and they're like, oh, wait a minute. They're here in, in the U.S. J Josh, how much do you spend a month on Google ads? Uh, not a ton, about a thousand bucks. Okay. People probably gasped in their seats when you just said a thousand bucks. I well, bet you I most the, people listening to this don't spend a thousand bucks on ads a month. Do uh, you think they, so, Bruce? No, but I think it's because it's hard to measure. I think people would spend it, but how, uh, how do you get, look yeah, at that? Is it, is it just clicks? Is it form no, fill outs? So we look at big it? picture. No, we tie it back to new customers for the month and average spend on our new customers. So we we are turning right about 11.5 to 13 um, return on ad spend. So so yeah, we, we measure a big picture. You take average new sale. Are you looking at the sales that that brought in? Or are you just saying, okay, overall... A new customer is generally about 800 bucks. And if we bring in 10 of those, that's $800. And no, I spent we're looking 80. at the actual numbers. So we're looking at this month, I spent $800. This month in new business, we did $18,000 and over an average of these many new customers. Got it. Gotcha. So it's an so, average so of those brought in. Right. So you don't have, do you have a way to track which customers came from Google or is that just, yeah, you just oh look yeah. at new customers? No, we, we definitely have a way to track uh, the way they come through Google. It ties back into the analytics in the back end. What do you, what tool do you use for that? Just Google analytics. And usually our introduction conversation is always, how'd you hear about us? That's usually the, one of the first things, because like I said, we do get a ton of referrals. And so we like to thank those people that refer to us um, by sending them something, giving them a call, thanking them, just touching base. And to be honest, it's funny enough, we get a ton of referrals from people that have only ordered from us once for like a special event or a special project. And then they hear of somebody needing something that fits with us. And they're like, oh, go talk to the sublimation house. They can do that for you. So when you think of a thousand bucks a month, like, why don't you put 2000 bucks a month on it? Because we're quality driven and making sure that we can meet the demand. Um, kind of like what we were touching based on the technology. We just implemented Printavo um, before we were using Asana um, because we just, we, we're still developing this as we go, you know, we're, we're still learning every single day. And so, but the big thing for us is our customer service and making sure we're meeting our need, the, the demand or what we're offering to our customers is fulfilled. And so we want to make sure that if we are offering it and people are wanting it, that we can meet that need. So we don't want to just go super ham and spend $10,000. And then all of a sudden we have more Let's orders than we can bits. handle. So it's mostly, it was mostly technological now that we got Printavo, we just got it up and running. We've been using it now for about two weeks, which has been wonderful. Um, and as soon as we get everybody on up to speed here, that's going to help a lot with making sure we can handle more. More volume. Yeah. So, okay. So Josh of the Sublimation House, sublimation in the United States is a very, it's, it's a very rare thing to come by. There are not too many companies that will cut and sew in the States or the quality is just not there. And, and so most people are sourcing, you know, we source our sublimation overseas, Correct. right? And when I think of sublimation, I look at it as like hell. Like if you want to learn to screen print, that's like, you know, five feet of hell. If you want to learn, if you want to go cut and sew sublimation, that's like a hundred feet of hell. Yes. Because like you got to print on a sheet of paper, you got a laser cut fabric, you got to heat press everything together. Then you got to sew it. Like we're just trying to register screens out here, you know? Yeah. Like we're, you know, we're just heat pressing DTF on a, on a, on a, on like simple stuff. Why? Are you, why did you decide to go? Why are you, why are you doing this? <laughs> so that's, that's, that's actually a great question. Um, so we have a brand ourselves. Uh, we have a children's clothing line, a pajama brand that's been around since 2008. Um, and out of the need of being able to provide our stores with the quality product that we know that we can create and put out, we couldn't find a reliable partner. We kept getting let down. We were outsourcing everything. Um, and we were just, it was just, it was hell. Like you were talking about, it was just, 
It's super painful. Um, and I came in and took over in 2018, not knowing anything about this industry. I'm just an entrepreneur. Um, I've been an entrepreneur my entire life, uh, but I'm a mechanic by trade. Um, I had an auto repair shop, four base, six technicians. I sold that. I had a medical company, uh, got out of that. And then I had a vape distribution company here in Vegas and the FDA messed that whole thing up. Um, but I fell into this. It was a family business. Unfortunately, family crisis happened in 2017. Um, and they needed me to come in and kind of take over. Uh, and so I did. And at that time, like I said, we were just outsourcing things. I didn't know what we were doing. And at that time, I didn't know I was building a factory. I was just trying to fix our need of being able to provide our stores with the product that they were asking for. We were, we were chokehold because they wanted more and we couldn't give them more or we couldn't give it to them on time or we couldn't turn it quick enough. And so I started building this. And then when I looked up in 2019, I was like, oh, shit, I got a factory here. Um, but we were we were one in full time. We had three days on four days on sometimes we're part day, part time shifts. And so I was like, man, why don't we start helping others with uh, their needs? And so I started reaching out to brands, but I was reaching out as the children's clothing line at that time. Again, I didn't know any better. And so I was reaching out and they, I was getting the conversation going. They're like, yeah, you're made in the U.S. I'm like, yeah, perfect. They look us up and they're like, wait a minute. Are you a factory or are you a little girl's pajama brand? And I'm like, well, technically we're both. <laughs> and then it finally clicked for me. I was like, okay, I need to separate the two. And then that's where the sublimation house was born. And now our mission is to bring back as much apparel manufacturing stateside in the sublimation space and help brands and organizations with their needs. Dang. <laughs> Congrats. <laughs> first Do, uh, Thank yeah, you. yeah, definitely. So the, it, it, you still run the children's clothing yeah. uh, pajama brand? Yep. And which is bigger now, that or the sublimation house? They're pretty even right now. They're pretty even right now. Subhouse is creeping up on on surpassing it uh, just because it's, you know, pajama brand is just us versus Subhouse we're producing for several. Um, but Subhouse mm -hmm. is, is creeping up. It's definitely, I think we might have surpassed it last year. I'm waiting for those final numbers. This year, we're definitely on track to surpass the brand. Can you, can you say, can you say for scale, you told me when we were talking a couple minutes ago, you, you, you guys are able to get eight to 10,000 pieces out a month, mm -hmm. which is incredible. Uh, that's three to 400, you know, four or 500 a day, whatever, uh, maybe more. Um, can you tell us what you were doing in 2019? If you're, if you're willing to share like or yeah. 2018, like when you took over the business just for scale. Yeah. Yeah. We were doing, we were doing about almost 700,000 as the brand. Um, and then that following year we doubled once okay. we, once That's from we your outreach. In. That was from, that was from the brand. That was just from us bringing in our, our factory in house Got and it. starting to be able to deliver the goods on time. Gotcha. You're doing a lot in pajamas. Oh yeah. Yeah. We're super popular on the East coast. <laughs> what's, what's the pajama brand called? Uh, Penelope Wildberry. So we're like a camp overnight camp brand, sleepaway camp, you know, summertime sleepaway camp brand. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know anything about no. sleepaway camp. Yeah. Brand so you, you know, like the, um, uh, what's that movie? Like a uh, parent trap, you know, parent trap, you know, that, you know, yeah. when the, the girls go to sleepaway camp, that's a real thing. That's a very real thing. I didn't know it existed either until I got in the, in the space, but it's a very real thing. So every summer, these kids go away for six to eight weeks um, and they go to sleep away camp and it's massive and it's full of events and all kinds of crazy stuff. And it's, it's insane. It's insane. That's Wild. a cool niche. <laughs> yeah. It's camp, but it's, you know, the kids want to bring good looking pajamas or clothes or oh yeah stuff, it's it's, it's it a high-end camp you know the tuition ranges yeah. from 12 to 15 grand for the summer just the tuition that's not including oh all the merch God. that they're bringing dang yeah <laughs> that's um, nuts. when you were doing when you started to do the outreach for subhouse uh you know you're it sounds like you were cold emailing cold calling whatever calling, it was dming yeah that's a great pr skill process like uh, w what was that to, you know, were you just reaching out to friends, I'm assuming first, but after that, you know, everyone combs through their contacts and then, yeah, then done. no, to be honest, I actually started like straight cold, cold. I was looking, I was looking through like Instagram, um, for brands that were sublimating. Um, and so I was looking at their, their clothes and looking at what they were offering, like their, their tops, their shorts, their leggings. I was looking at the brands that I could tell were sublimated and I was specifically reaching out to those. 
Interesting. You know, I don't think our industry, I think when we're, when we are younger in business, <clears throat> we have that hustle yeah. where we're just like hitting people up, calling yeah. your friends, families. The and then over time we, you know, business starts to come in and you start to lose that hustle and that grind and to, to keep DMing people or to keep reaching out. Today, you said you don't, you, you do all inbound through Google. Are you still in people's DMs? Are yeah, you still? 100%. Okay. Yeah. So I, I like to call it here. Jonathan, one of my guys here, uh, he's been with me for quite some time and he's, he's, he's one of the good ones here. And, um, we talk about it all the time. I still say we're at day zero. Um, we're still at day zero because, uh, the vision I have for where we're going and what we want to build here is massive. And we're not even a needle in the haystack yet. Um, in what we're trying to build. Um, okay. Can we talk a little bit about sublimation itself? You had to get sewers, assemble a factory by laser, like laser sublimation printers patterns. And at the time you, yeah, patterns, you know, and, and, you know, is it cost of, I understand from an efficiency standpoint to be able to do something in house and, and near shore here is like so much better for, for everyone. Yeah. But from a cost standpoint, isn't it like way more expensive 100%. to run die sub in the States? 100%, especially in the beginning. I mean, I would have probably attribute most of our cost of goods in the beginning was on learning, learning the process. I mean, it took us almost a year and a half to realize one of the fabrics that we sell the most of, we were pressing in the opposite direction and we kept running into remakes and issues and something so as soon as it clicked, I was like, damn, we should have known that. Like, we know this fabric is directional. We should have been pressing it in the opposite direction of how it enters the drum. And so, yeah, it's a huge learning curve and it's definitely expensive. But once you get it down, you can be cost effective with it. So that's one of the things. So 2022, 2021 was like our first, like towards the end of 2021 was like our first year of like starting to really manufacture um, apparel for other brands. Um, and 2022 was just lessons and lessons and lessons. Um, and then 2023, we kind of took from those lessons and started honing in a little bit more. And then towards the end of 2023, we really realized what we were good at and what we needed to do. Kind of that 80-20 rule, like 80% of our money comes from these 20% of products that we offer. And so we trimmed our catalog way down because um, in the beginning, we offered something like 180 different products, which was crazy. Um, now we're down to like about 65, 70 different styles that we offer. Um, and by trimming it down and narrowing what was like good for us and what we were good at ourselves and what we can turn quick and what we were the best at, um, it really makes a difference. And so now since end of 2023, we kind of perfected that. And so 2024 has been off to an amazing start. Like our, our, our turn times are beautiful. We're getting things out with like nearly almost no mistakes. Um, and so we're starting to reap those benefits, but yeah, it was, it was three years of a lot of, lot of mistakes. <laughs> A lot of mistakes, a lot of learning. And unfortunately, like you were talking in the beginning, you know, the sublimation is is hell. There's not a ton of us out there. Um, and the people that are out there for the most part don't share. There's not, you know, a ton of YouTube videos on it. There's no forums really on what we do. There's home stuff, home sublimation, but factory sublimation, there's really no content out there. And we've been trying to put out some more on that so we could help others in the space. Um, but yeah, it was, it was hard. <laughs> I have this. Uh, note here of a uh, last straw of you bringing all the work in house. <laughs> I, yeah. I see 30k order done wrong. Now is this thirty thousand pieces? Thirty thousand dollars? Raw goods, <laughs> cut upside down. Does that does that top you, Farag? Do you have uh, a thirty thousand piece order gone wrong or more? No. <laughs> <laughs> and it was dollar well, value, so that? not pieces, but it was, yeah, it oh, was oh, dollar, 30, right, okay. P, uh, dollar amount. Yeah. Upside down. It was cut upside down. They're like, oh, order again. We'll give you a discount. I'm like, what about this stuff? And yeah, it was like, yeah, no. Jeez. Oh my goodness. So you, you, wow. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's a pretty expensive mistake. Uh, 
Holy cow. How did you learn to, to – do you sew yourself? Do you have some people that are awesome no, sewers? Yeah, like- no, I have a great team here. So Andres is our production manager. He's been with me literally pretty much since day one. Um, he's He's got a nice – he's got a great, great work ethic. Like all of us here, we're a big family here. So it, we're not – we don't just bring anybody in. Um, my kids come in here almost on a daily basis. Um, I got – Two, three sets of husband and wives that work here. Um, Andres, my production manager, his oldest daughter worked for us after school, all throughout high school. Um, and so like we're super family centric as well. And he, he's just, Andres is just, he's a beast. He's an animal. There's no way to describe it. He's really, really good at what he does. Um, and if he's not, he'll figure it out. He'll bounce ideas off the other guys. I personally just started, um, learning sewing last year. And so now I know how to sew. Obviously I can't do production by no means. But at least I know how to sew. I know how to use all of our major food groups in the machines like overlock, cover stitch, single needle, um, flat lock. And so I know how to sew, but you can't put me on the line because I'm going to be the I'm going to be the guy that gets fired. <laughs> I, uh, I have a confession to make. I just bought a sewing machine. Nice. I just I what went kind? on Amazon. A singer. Or to do like what to do what? I don't know. A single needle. I was just on it. Still in the box. <laughs> <laughs> It's over there. Uh, I don't know. It was a sing- singer, something like that. Okay. I just yeah. was like, I was like, man, I just want to learn how to sew. I think it'd be super cool. I, I spent some time in Honduras with Gildan and saw the sewers there and what they yeah. do. And it's just like, it's just like magic. It is. Um, it's a, it's a super cool skill. And it's just, uh, I was just like, I want to learn how to sew. Now you said something there about Andre, Andreas. Is that uh-huh. his name? Andres. Yeah. Uh, when you found him or brought him in, how do you keep like when you have that person? Yeah, who's your guy? Without him, your business wouldn't be where it is. Let's Correct. just say hundred percent. Right? No, that's true. Um, how do you incentivize him? Keep him motivated? Keep him bought in? Do you give like? You know, yeah, obviously we almost take, sounds like yeah, yeah. Well, obviously we take care of them financially, you know. But to be honest, not a lot. Of, it's crazy, but not most people are also driven financially. Like some people, as long as they get to pay their bills, they're comfortable. Um, but it's mostly about, like I said, back to the family thing. You know, we we try to have meals here at least once a week together. You know, we're always talking. We go to each other's kids' parties. You know, we're we're we, we we're a community. We're building a community, and so people like to sense like they belong to something a bigger mission, a bigger community. Um, and that's what we have. We have a mission here uh, and we are community. We help each other out whenever we need it. If we, if we got a problem on the personal, we, you know, his kids come into work sometimes when he needs to, like, we're just here to build just one big community around the same mission, which is creating quality apparel. Steven, you do that too. Like with uh, hiring friends and, um, you know, kind of building a tighter knit group. I was always a little, scared of doing that i think just as you know doesn't work out now what uh and it was easier to be a little bit more unbiased i think with some of those decisions if if we weren't friends before i steven how do you how did you think about that or is it like i they're just the best for the job so it didn't matter so uh when we started to really grow in the last couple of years i hired some really close people in my life um, our CFO, our VP of sports, our CTO, um, they all, I've had previous relations, you know, worked with them, traveled with them. I think when we interviewed them and when I interviewed them and talked through it, we talked about what would happen if we disagreed, what would happen in our friendship? What if it didn't go right? What if, you know, like all we, we talked about these things almost like we were going to like date a little bit, um, because not everything is going to go really well. And so um, I brought them in because they are probably the only people in my life that can counterbalance me. (laughs) And I trust, right? And trust is a really, really big thing for me. And so when they decided to leave their jobs and join us and they made that commitment, I also now have to make that commitment to them. I'm, I'm now in charge of their livelihood, which is scary a little bit. Like a lot of so. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Like I'm in charge. Like, yeah, I want to make sure everyone gets paid every two weeks, myself included. So then there's things that we do for them to keep them part of the family, whether it's travel, whether it's just little different things here and there and let them benefit from some of the perks that I have from owning the company and maybe share those with them a little bit so they can feel like they are part of it. Have you ever thought, Josh, about like giving your key employees a piece of the business? 
thousand percent. We've already talked about it. Really? How so? Oh, yeah. yeah How so would there, you do it? So it's going to be vested as they earn it. Um, we're still working out the details with our attorney. Um, but yeah, and Andres and Jonathan, both two of my key people here will definitely have a piece of subhouse. They won't have any control and say or anything. It'll just be just a piece that they get, a, you know, their profit every quarter from. Um, but yeah, they're, they're going to get a piece of this business because like you said, without them, we couldn't build what we built or go where we're going. So what, Josh is referring to, I think, I don't know if S Corps can do this, Bruce, or not, but you can, you can actually issue like equity stocks, like, or, or stock options, mm-hmm. or you can issue equity. There's a tool called like Carta that you can use. And what happens is you issue it to them. There's all these legal things that happen. And then there's a vesting period. And so it might say for the first year, it doesn't vest. And then after that, you get a point of a point every six months or something like that. Exactly. And there's all these different like ways. Phantom though. What? <clears throat> I think this sounds like phantom stock, which is another form where you don't have to legally offer options, <clears throat> but it creates a revenue share agreement in a way where it, you know, it allows people to say it's, I think it's more similar to law firms, for example. So, you know, partnership share in some sort of upside of how well the law firm does in the end, the, which from my understanding is a lot less of a legal burden because you don't have to set up all of these crazy contracts and everything for a typical stock option, but it does allow people to have a piece of the business and or the, just the upside. Bruce, um, does, Car- does Carta run fan, fan? Like, are there tools maybe, out there that manage it? It may be. Carta.com is a way to like keep track if you have a lot of different folks uh, that have options. So you could definitely use that. I found it kind of complicated. <laughs> especially if there's only a couple people. But um, the one tricky thing I had, and I I have seen people work it out though, is reinvesting. So it was always a balance of how do you carve out a a profit share structure when you're trying to reinvest for future growth? And that was always the the push and pull, right? Because it was, well, look, we got to hire this next person because they can help manage this and do that and take this off my plate. But that cuts into the profit share pool. And so, um, you know, the profit share pool starts to to decrease over time. The way that I think if I would have looked back, that would have been better is I would have probably budgeted X percent maybe of salary to give as a bonus and then use that as that like bonus pool and, and, and try to budget it that way to give versus um, let's share in the profit upside. Josh, how, like, is that how you're thinking about, it or how how would you, how do you think you'd carve it out? Um, to be honest, uh, it I don't know. It's it's to me, I look at it more like you said, overall picture. Um, and to be honest, that's another big reason why Printavo I think is going to help us tremendously because not only for them but for the whole team here, um, I've been wanting to set up a bonus structure for quite some time, yeah, but I haven't had any way to truly measure our KPIs, truly measure our our profit. You know, we use QuickBooks like, you know, most other people. Um, but I have to wait for my bookkeeper to go in there and reconcile everything and then the accountant to check everything out. And so with Printavo and putting in the expenses per job, as well as our overhead expenses, at, at I usually do it every at the end of the week is how I have it set up now. So any other expenses that don't fit in between each individual job. So like payroll, you know, rent, light, phone, things of that sort, I'll put it in there um, once a week. And so being able to truly measure those KPIs, um, not just for the, for Andres and Jonathan, but for the whole team here, I've been wanting to implement just an overall bonus. Like, hey, last month we did X amount of percentage. Here's this, here, this, here, this, you know, because um, my big thing is it, I, I don't want you to trade your hours for dollars. I want you to be, especially with our sewing thing, um, they can be really efficient with sewing and really quick with things. And a lot of things we do don't have to be time consuming. So if we can crank out more, which means we can bring in more business, I don't want you to just have your hourly. I want you to also get a bonus on top of that, that could be measured based on the output. Mm-hmm. Have you yeah. thought about that, Steven, or you guys incentives are hard they're hard so they're they're hard to structure they're hard to manage and they're hard to track yeah and i've definitely flopped several times whether it's uh 
hey, we're going to create a bonus pool. And for every job that doesn't go well, we'll pull it out of that pool. Well, it was I gone. I remember that. It was, it was gone. <laughs> was in, it was like gone in like... Years. It was gone in like three days. Yeah. They're like, yeah, we've, we've, we've messed up that order. Oh, there went the bonus pool for the month. Okay. Yeah. Then it was like, then it was like, <laughs> okay, let's do, uh, for every correct job they do, that's perfect. We'll do an extra dollar or something like that. We did that for a while and it worked. Um, but now we're to the point where, you know, leadership is tied into the bottom line of the company and then employees get bonuses on the holidays and, that's how they operate, right? And so I think when you're small, you can start to do those things. But if you're not careful, you can also lose your employees' trust. They'll be like, they're just trying to gamify too much for me. So I definitely have had some swings, misses, you know. Um, I've incentivized the wrong thing. <laughs> or yeah, <laughs> I've accident. incentivized the wrong activity. Right. Yeah, 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 100%. Because you think it's like, so, for example, here, here's one that I did more on the sales commission side years ago. So... We said, oh, okay, hey, look, a new account on average, let's call it, is about $200 a month. Well, let's just incentive, let's make it simpler and incentivize new accounts. So, um, you know, don't think about the revenue, just accounts. <clears throat> well, team goes, you know, sales team, they're going to figure it out because they want to make more commission. They want to do their thing. Awesome. They start signing up tons of new accounts. Well, guess what? The plans all of these new accounts are on. They're on the, the they're on the, the lower end plans. Yeah. yeah, just to get people in the door. Um, well, that number doesn't work out to the math I originally had. So the average <laughs> account print coming in is probably half of the calculated amount, and that commission structure like didn't work. You know, so not that that was a bonus, but kind of similar. In, yeah, in that as commission selling scraps. Yeah, jeez. Yeah. I don't know. I think there's, if anyone has a good employee incentive plan in production, DM us because yes. I'd love to, uh, love to chat through it. I think what I want to see is, is there one that has lasted more than like two years? Yeah. Cause I think everyone's got awesome plans, but I'm like, let's check. I mean, that's is where we've struck out is, is sustainability of it. Mm -hmm. Um, so although maybe that's okay. Like the company in two years is probably very different anyway. Right. And what you care about may be very different. True. But a program should be able to stay consistent because as you grow, obviously those people then scale up to the next level, but your entry or you're starting a new fresh wave that would should fall into that new or that same category of incentives that you had for that previous level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Josh, it's what other challenges do you feel like you face now that, that, that you're working through in, in your role running the business? Um, the technology is, is the biggest challenge that we've had, um, as of late It's just having the right tools to allow us to do what we do. Thankfully on the production side, we're solid. We're gravy. We, 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 we got it pretty well handled. Um, it's the technology of balancing inbound what's coming in. You know, we're really, really good at one order with a thousand pieces and then, but we're really bad at a thousand orders of one piece, you know? And so that's where we're trying to find that balance. Um, cause when we first started out in the space, which really I, I hated doing eventually, um, we had no minimums. We just, we took on everything. So we had a ton of, and we, and, and I like it. I, I, I don't mind doing it, but the problem is we just weren't structured or set up properly to handle it. <clears throat> um, and then eventually we had to, go to minimums. We had to in go to minimums to be able to make sure, you know, we're profitable. Obviously at the end of the day, we have to be, if not, we won't make it. And so finding the right tools to allow us to find the midway between, you know, minimums and, and, you know, drop shipping and low, 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 low order, uh, volume is, is kind of our biggest challenge. Hmm. With profitability, <clears throat> in such a complex process to get products out the door. How do you think about that? Right. So, you know, do, have you ever had to do a time study or like, how, how does that oh, back yeah. into the pricing and how you charge to make oh, sure yeah. a job 100%. is profitable? Yeah, no, it goes, definitely goes back to time. So we were doing a lot of it manually through Asana. Um, and so what we were doing is we were creating time blocks based on pay periods. Cause obviously we can't, 
measure it daily really or monthly um and then it's also a little bit of a complex situation too because when it comes out to you know the time the order comes in versus the time the order actually leaves it's there's a there's a window you know anywhere from one to three weeks so it's not like order comes in today and it leaves tomorrow because it's a pick and pack you know that doesn't that doesn't really work in our model it's got to go through the full production process it's got to go to art it's got to go to layout it's got to go to printing it's got to go to pressing it's got to go to cutting it's got to go to sewing it's got to go to finishing and then it's got to go pack and ship and go out the door um and so making sure that we had that structure is is been key uh can you uh have you had any huge wins like i think you'd said somewhere you had some pretty big names that you were working on like you worked on beast mode for yep. marshawn lynch yeah yeah can you toss to talk to us about some of those pivotal moments or those big wins that you got? What do those do for your business? What was yeah, the scale of those kind of things? For sure. Yeah. So Beastmo is actually a, a pretty crazy story. It's actually a really, a really cool one too. Um, so my wife was actually pregnant um, with our youngest at that time um, when he had, um, I got, he, he was referred to us um, and he, he hit me up. He wanted to come by and meet with us and it got delayed. And then he ended up coming. It was on a Thursday. So he was supposed to come at 4 p.m. on a Thursday and something happened and it got pushed back. And some for something was going down with my wife and I had to take her to the emergency room right down the street. Um, but we we both knew Marshawn Lynch was coming. I was like, I can't miss out this opportunity. But obviously, the baby and you are important. Um, and so I got her to the hospital, waited for someone to meet me there, and then I took off. And as I pulled back into the factory, um, he was pulling in too, so it was like perfect timing. Um, and we we gave him a tour. We had given him a tour previously um, when he first came, but this that time he wasn't looking for anything. His wheels got clicking, and he finally wanted to do something. And he came in and he dropped a project on us and was like, can you turn this by tomorrow? I'm like, my guy, it's it's, <laughs> it, it's five o'clock. What's going on here? I was like, hold up. Let me go talk to Andres. And so I went to the back. I talked to Andres. I was like, bro, can we get this? Can we get this done? How um, many pieces? It was 100 pieces. Full cut and sew. Yeah. Um, like full, full cut and sew. We didn't even have the design cut ready yet. So 24 hour turnaround. You better not, not say this it, out loud. It, uh, wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't even 24 hours. And so I talked to Andres and he's like, if you come in at 2 a.m., we can get it done. I was like, fuck it. Let's do it. So, yeah, we made it happen um, and we delivered and that we earned his business pretty much for life after that. That's incredible. <laughs> how much revenue? What is that? Not Maybe if you don't want to share, how much has that turned into? Um, it's turned into a decent amount. It's not it's nothing crazy because um, he does a lot of screen print stuff for the most part for his brand. Um, and so we don't have screen print in house yet. We do hopefully plan on bringing it in this year um, in, in house because uh, we do most of our customers also do screen print, um, but they outsource it to other areas and stuff. Um, and so eventually we will have it here. Uh, so the majority of his business is screen print. So we don't do a ton of him, um, but it has helped on other ends. So his network has then tapped in with us. Um, so we do several things, not just for him, but for his network that also saw the, the product we produced. Now, Josh, what's a typical turnaround time? If I just, and I notice you guys don't publicize your prices, which I kind of understand maybe a little bit, like you don't want to, you know, it's a competitive, competitive landscape. If I were to inquire in, you know, what's a typical turnaround time for sublimated tees or jerseys or something? Yeah, to be honest, I want to change that on the site. Like, uh, we just we're working on, on a rebuild now because I do want to show like range of prices based on on tiered um, volume uh, as just we haven't had a chance to work on it yet. Uh, but we, we are working on a rebuild to kind of put more information out there. Mm -hmm. um, but standard turnaround is anywhere from two to three weeks. Um, and one of the first qualifying questions we ask when an order comes in is when do you need it by? Um, and because we like to set expectations right out the gate and making sure that one, we can deliver on time. And two, if we can't, we let you know that before you place your order. Um, and this way we can manage those expectations. Um, but we have, like I just said, we've turned stuff in 24 hours. We've turned stuff in two days, three days. Um, it just really depends on what our current 
production flow is um, and what type of garment or product that is needed, whether art is ready, whether it needs individual names and numbers, what style of pattern. Is it a T-shirt? Is it a button down? Is it a jersey? Is it reversible? Is it shorts? You know, it just really depends on the garment and what we got going on in production at that time. I think what I've learned about production that what I've learned about sublimation that's different than screen printing is that sublimation is such a linear process and there are like there are long steps, you know, whether it's just sewing the sleeves or just doing all the placements and pattern building, right? And having to do that for all the different sizes and then like printing it through the the rolls and then sublimating it. It's not like burn screens print shirts. Correct. <laughs> um, there are so many different steps along the way. I'm curious though, you know, with how international shipping is going and it's getting better and getting stronger, do you guys still for your overflow bring stuff in from overseas? No. We don't do anything okay. overseas. Everything's made right here. If we don't do it here, we don't sell it. Gotcha. So it's not like, you know, you'll because you know, I imagine like in South America you could get sublimated stuff oh, for yeah. a lot cheaper, right? 100%. And so I was kind of curious, are you for your overflow, are you like out are you outsourcing when you can? Have you ever thought about setting up a factory like mm. in another country or doing that? No. no. Our mission so like, is American made by Americans. That's that's our mission is here. Um obviously, yeah, there's tons of people that do that, especially as they scale up. Um, but I, I wanna feed our community. I wanna keep it local. I wanna uh, that's been a bigger driver. It's been pushing more and more. And to be honest, it's actually been quite the opposite. More brands are leaving that have come to us they, dealing with overseas. They hate the time difference. They hate the WeChat, the WhatsApp. They, they hate they can't jump on the call real quick. You know, <laughs> it's, you Whoa. know, they, they what app am I on more now? WhatsApp or the messages app? <laughs> Bruce, you've been trying, Bruce, you've been working with scrub manufacturers overseas. It is not easy. No, it's a wild west. It's such a wild west. You don't know who's who, what you're talking talking to what you're giving it's exactly just, the it's sizing just, uh, they, you, you know the you sizing start from difference. zero trust and you're building trust <laughs> over yeah the sizing is another thing of what they expect the small to be versus small um, and then chinese new year hits oh yeah, yeah. and, you're and like, then it's and, done and then, they send you greeting cards you get, you get cool whatsapp <laughs> yeah. oh, yeah. uh, cards yeah. that everyone opens oh, yeah. uh, emojis yeah. and uh yeah and i think the other part about it is um you know yeah, you could shop listening to this. Yeah, you could go on Alibaba. You could order. You have to be careful where you're ordering garments from, from other sides of the world. If you're not careful, you could be ordering them from actually like really bad regions um, mm. that uh, like support like slave trade and things like that. And so it's if, if you're not good at it, you want to be really, 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 really careful. Um, and that's where like the factories we use had to go through audits um, to make sure like, you know, compliance stuff and HR stuff and you know cleanliness and work workers rights and all that stuff. So you want to be really careful about just like going on the internet because you could be getting some like yeah. bad user stuff broker that's bad for the world. User broker. Right. There's tons of broker agencies that have US based people that also have their people in the factories overseas. Um, and so it's an internal team and they're there during your entire production run, their QC and everything for you. Obviously you pay a little bit of a premium for that that uh consultant, I guess they call it. Um, but at least this way you're making sure that your dollars are safe because you're gonna get the product you expect. Super Josh, we appreciate you uh, spending time with us. Yeah. You can find Josh uh, and reach out. I'm assuming people will want to, especially being US made. TheSublimationHouse.com, Instagram at TheSublimationHouse as well. Um, and is your is your email? Is it Josh at TheSublimationHouse too? Correct. Yes. Yep. Yeah, Josh, thanks so much. And we no, appreciate you guys, guys. pronouncers, for joining us on another episode of Pratawa Pronouncers Podcast. This is a unique one, a little bit different. So thank you so much for being able to share and being so transparent. Of course. I appreciate you having me. All right. We'll sign it off. We'll see you guys in the next episode. Thanks so much for listening. Hopefully that was informative. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like. Don't forget to hit the bell for notifications if you enjoyed this video. If you enjoy all the stuff we're putting out, it's really helpful. We love to just be able to see it. That means that we're doing a good job. To subscribe, hit the bell for notifications and hit the like button. And I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.